inmersivas, realidad virtual, realidad aumentada, ¿qué creen que ven aquí? Estoy viendo la realidad virtual. Interesantes, tenemos a Eric Posma de inteligencia artificial, es una revolución de la inteligencia artificial. We have a special speaker and also we call to Daniel and, and Eric to be in the stage. Please, you can come in. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Juan, do you want to introduce our speaker? Yes, perfect. Thank so you. Thank you all for, for being here. We are going to start now with our first uh, speaker, Eric. Postma and Eric Postma is a professor in, in artificial intelligence at the Cogn Cognitive Science and AI Department at Tilburg University and the Geronimus Academy of Data Science in Hertogenbosch, a joint initiative of Eindhoven University of Technology and Tilburg University. Eric is a member of CIE. IPN and the Lawrence Center Comput Computational Science Board. Uh, Eric, thank you very much for joining us today and the stage is all yours. Thank you very much for this introduction. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, so, uh, and, and also stop, uh, please when you want to move the slides, you can tell me next and uh, we make silence now. Oh, so you're my assistant. That's great. Yes, yes. So, um, <laughs> so my my presentation will take ten minutes, wasn't it? <laughs> so uh, I will give an overview of artificial intelligence, which is, of course, undergoing a revolution right now, and uh, it is relevant for virtual and augmented reality, but many other domains. And the idea of this presentation is to give you, give you some overview of what is happening, what it is about, and what is happening in AI. So next slide, please. That's, is that the next slide? <laughs> A few slides further. So, um, yes. This picture shows you uh, pirates on the left and serious scientists on the right. And AI researchers are more like pirates because they explore parts of the scientific world that are forbidden and they try out things that are forbidden. Whereas scientists, uh, for instance, people work in statistics, keep uh, themselves to the scientific laws. And actually the current revolution in AI, as I will explain, is the result of the pirate's behavior where you explore things that actually are not permitted. Next slide, please. So I will give a brief history of AI to uh, make you aware of where we are now in the history of the development of AI. Next slide, please. So this is Alan Turing, you might have heard of him. He is the, uh, or he was the inventor of the computer. He was a mathematician and a brilliant uh, mathematician who thought about how you could build what we nowadays call a computer. Of course, he used uh, mathematics for that. Uh, but it, sometimes he's considered to be the grandfather of AI, as will be shown on the next slide, please. So he wrote a paper in 1950, which was about a test, which is now known, known as the Turing test, uh, because he anticipated that before the year 2000, we would have computers that would be as intelligent as humans and could not be distinguished from humans in a test called the Turing test. And um, mainly the most important uh, notion that he had was that if you have a computer that works with zeros and ones, switches that are on or, or off, then that's a hardware that is different from the hardware of humans. So if you consider a human brain like a computer, of course, uh, a human brain looks totally different from a computer, but uh, that's the hardware. But Alan Turing said the software, so the programs that run on these computers, whether it's the brain or, the com or a digital computer, uh, are the same. And that was actually a main inspiration source for the first step in AI. Next slide, please. So the general idea was that biology was irrelevant to AI. So it doesn't matter if you want to build an intelligent system, you don't have to look at the natural example of how animals or humans are intelligent, but uh, just uh, because you can ignore the hardware, whether it switches or neurons or brain cells, it doesn't matter. This was the idea 
that gave rise to the early days of AI. Next slide, please. So the first stage of AI, and I typically make a distinction between the first and second stage, is called symbolic AI. So this was the times where people were emphasizing formal logic. So um, people are called intelligent if they're very uh, proficient in mathematics, for instance, or if they are very good in reasoning. But uh, actually, that's something that a computer can do much better. So playing chess or making calculations or, or these kind of things, that's where the computer is much better than humans. So that's why in this first stage of AI, people were not looking at the biological example. They ignored it actually actively because they said, we're not interested in the hardware, we're focusing on the software. And associated with, with this were all kinds of AI developments that focused on what we call high level cognition. So reasoning, problem solving, et cetera. Next slide, please. And the general idea was that statistics was irrelevant to AI because you could capture anything in deterministic rules. So rules that are explicit and describe our knowledge of the world. And this, uh, this knowledge of the world is encoded in if then rules. And if you have any experience with computer programming, you know that most computer programs are based on if-then rules and other structures. But this, this was the basis, basis of the ideas in the first stage of AI. Now, uh, of course, we have many successes in this first stage of AI. We had uh, computer chess that was uh, outperforming uh, the best human chess player. But there was an interesting development uh, when uh, uh, NASA developed a robot to uh, be uh, sent to Mars. Next slide, please. So we had all these intelligent systems that could play chess or do some problem solving based on if-then rules, so-called expert systems. But NASA was interested in building a smart or intelligent robot that could be navigating on Mars. Because of the communication delay between Earth and Mars, which is 8 to 20 minutes, it's very hard to have a remote controlled robot on Mars. So they wanted to have an aut autonomous robot that could avoid ro uh, rocks and cliffs and these kind of things. And they invited some AI uh, specialists, but it turned out that these AI specialists, uh, because they were focusing on high level cognition, were not able to help uh, the NASA in developing this robot. And this gave rise to a new stream in AI. Next slide, please which is known as the sub-symbolic AI, which is uh, put more emphasis on machine learning, the automatic learning on the basis of examples. It took neuroscience uh, seriously because it, it said, well, if we want to understand how robots can perceive their environment, we have to look at the biological example. We have to know how humans and other animals are doing that. So there was a new stream in AI which, uh, where machine learning, which is now used uh, by the big companies like Facebook and Google, became uh, an active field of research. And of course, statistics became relevant because it's all about learning models and building statistical models on the basis of examples. And there was an emphasis no longer on high-level cognition, but on low-level cognition. For instance, next slide, please how to recognize my dog. So this is our dog. It's a very nice dog, but you can see this dog can be put in all kinds of positions. In computer vision, this is called a non-rigid uh, object because it's not a fixed uh, shape, but it's a shape that can vary. Uh, in the field of computer vision, people worked for a very long time to automatically recognize these kind of images and they failed. And the problem was that it was very hard to build a computer system that could match the human performance in associating these kind of pictures with, uh, for instance, the, the fact that this is a dog or maybe the, the, the type, the breed of dog or something like that. Next slide, please. And the biological inspiration uh, that led to new developments in AI and is actually at the heart of the current uh, revolution in AI was based on the notion that we should take the brain and the hardware seriously. And if you look in the brain, we have these small computers uh, called neurons, which are like small computers, but are much slower than the computers that we have on our desktop. But we have billions of them and they all work together. And apparently they work very efficiently because we can recognize this dog. And if you're a dog expert, you even know what uh, br the breed of the dog is. Now, uh, I won't go into detail about these neural networks, but in the next slide, uh, next slide, please. 
you see a kind of graphical representation. So the, the idea of a neural network is that you put something in the input, like this image of a dog, and of course this is a digital image. And at the output, you would like to have a uh, an answer that says, well, this is this breed of dog. And let's say you have 20 or 40 different breeds. If you give it an image, the, the network should automatically give the correct answer. So it's a kind of breed detector or breed classifier, where given a, an image of a dog, it can uh, estimate the breed of the dog, something that people that are well into dogs can also do. And what's happening in this black box, in this neural network, can be imagined like a system with all kinds of knobs that you can turn. Of course, you don't manually turn these knobs. This is something that you learn by training the neural network on a lot of examples. And the current revolution in AI is actually about that if you train such a system with many of these knobs, not a few hundred, but thousands to millions of these knobs, then it learns the transformation from this image towards this output that is the breed of the dog. Next slide, please. And this is an example of what is now called a deep learning network. So at the bottom, you see an image of, of a dog. And at the output, you see all kinds of breed names of dogs. And this happens to be a Samoyed. I know that because our dog is a Samoyed. And this network has been trained on 1,000 examples per dog breed to learn to recognize the visual features that predict the breed of the dog. And this is one of the many examples of what now can be done in these neural networks. But what you have to realize is that these neural networks have a lot of these knobs in there. And the te technical name for these knobs are parameters. So it's sometimes called an overparameterized model. And the use of so many free parameters would never be permitted by people working in statistics. So these are, the, the, in the first slide that I show, the people with the white coats. But the AI pirates did this. Next slide, please. So if you look into these trained networks, and this is an example of a network that is trained on uh, gender recognition. So you give an input to the network uh, of an image of a face, and the output uh, estimates whether it's a female or male face. And if you look into this black box, you can even see where the individual neurons respond to. And here you see that uh, at the lowest layer, it looks at uh, transitions from light to dark, so the contours of a face. Then the intermediate layer, you see uh, eyes and eyebrows. And at the top layer, you see complete faces. And the interesting thing is that this is not programmed into the system. It's learned automatically from the data, from the labeled data set. So in this case, the system was trained with uh, thousands of pictures of females and males and the network uh, develops itself these kind of internal representations. And the funny thing is that they look very much like the internal representations of human visual systems. So in neuroscience, you can measure the responses of individual neurons in the visual system, and they have a similar response pattern. So there's some similarity with the human visual system. Next slide, please. Now, the main... Uh, point now is that if you uh, consider these pirates and these uh, statisticians, in statistics, it's known that if you want to build a powerful model, you should reduce the number of parameters. And to reduce the number of parameters to make sure that your model performs well. And um, these AI pirates, they increase the number of parameters because if more of these knobs, more of these parameters, the models work better. So there's a kind of inconsistency um, that has not been resolved yet. Next slide, please. Now, there's an interesting development in the fundamental research to explain why all these parameters help, and that's called the lottery ticket hypothesis. Next slide, please. So the idea is that you can prune these models. You have all these parameters, but then you can remove some of these parameters after you have trained the models. And it turns out that if you prune the model and you train them again, that they perform worse than the original uh, one. Next slide, please. But if you follow an approach where you train a network, where you typically randomly give them random weights at the beginning, and then after pruning, you retrain the network with the same initial weights, you get a network that performs better. Next slide, please. So this overparameterization suggests that it's only necessary for training these new networks. To have a fully operational network, you don't need all these parameters. It's only to facilitate training. So this is a kind of fundamental insight which explains why these pirates and these statisticians 
the, the, the people in the white coats are disagreeing, uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, in order to facilitate training, you need more parameters. But once you learn, have learned a model, you can do with less parameters. Next slide, please. So here you see an example, what is the effect with respect to an original network? If you, um, if you look at the blue lines, this is the improved performance on the left in terms of how fast you can train and on the right in terms of accuracy that is obtained by applying this pruning approach. Next slide, please. And there's even more recent work that suggests if you have a over-parameterized network with all kinds of connections that are random, then in this random multi-layer network, there might be a hidden, a sub-network that is actually already solving the task. So you don't even have to learn. And this has a kind of resemblance to human development, where in the beginning of your human development as a baby, you have uh, actually too many connections in your brain and you prune away connections throughout your experiences in the, in the outside world. And that brings you to adulthood. So this is very similar to what we also see in, in uh, deep learning. Next slide, please. So uh, the conclusion is there is a huge number of connections in both the brain and in these deep learning networks that somehow incorporate a solution. And the main challenge is to find the sub-network to make sure that you can map these images that come in the, in the input to the classes in the output. And in nature, this happens during early development. And as a general remark, I think these kind of developments, first of all, provide a foundation, like, like you could say with these white coats, uh, that is more fundamental for AI and also helps to have the current revolution uh, lead to more transparent and more reliable uh, models. Thank you very much. Please, you can press the button. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel. Yes, tell me, Alexandra, what did you like most? Oh, my goodness. I have many brilliant ideas in how we can apply artificial intelligence in virtual reality, but we can ask to Eric, Eric, how we can apply in, a, in our virtual reality, the artificial intelligence. Yeah, so before answering that, I think the general thing is that this deep learning method is so powerful mm -hmm. that it's now used in all domains of science and of in society. So if you ever hear these stories about AI is taking over humanity and these nonsense, that's not true. It's, it's humans are still superior, so don't worry. But on very specific <laughs> tasks, okay. Um, <laughs> very specific tasks, um, narrow AI uh, is much better able to um, uh, outperform humans. And we all know this pocket calculator that you used at school, that's also outperforming humans. So it's nothing to be afraid of. What we should do is make sure that this technology is applied in the proper way. And now in terms of uh, virtual and augmented reality, uh, deep learning is actively being used to enhance augmented reality because you have to integrate the out, a picture of the, or a video of the outside world with artificial elements. And this is something where deep learning can work very well. So actually anytime you want to uh, learn something from data uh, in the image domain or in the visualization domain, deep learning is, uh, is the state of the art technology. Oh, thank you. I've seen that uh, Snapchat, the, the company that uses machine learning to detect, for example, cats and dogs to uh, use it for augmented reality. So it's amazing what machine learning can do, no? Yeah, yeah. Someone have a question? You need to press the button uh, F0 here. Yeah. Cindy, uh, Daniel, you have in the in the, you have the questions. We don't have questions here in YouTube. Oh, questions in YouTube or Facebook. Eric, uh, I have a question. Um, and you you need to press the button F zero. <laughs> what? What? 
Juan Manuel. De F Sir. <laughs> okay, what is your question? My question is about the the appliance and the democratization of this technology. Uh, and we we are thinking about we are hearing a lot about artificial intelligence. And I think I I'm I'm not an expert on that field. I work on, on virtual reality and augmented reality, but I think it's happening the same as we are hearing about a lot of the term, but do you think we still need a lot of democratization for this technology to really expand to different audience? Yes, I think uh, what is the main concern is not the technology, but the use of technology. And uh, as was already mentioned, companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, and also Baidu from China have a huge uh, uh, power over the use of this technology. And of course, there are examples of, of totally wrong use of this technology in China for um, treating minorities. Um, I think the democratization should uh, lead to, uh, to re should resolve that. So I think that's the most dangerous thing about the AI is not the technology, but the fact that there are some big companies and some big players that have full control over the technology. That's the dangerous thing about it. And I think um, it's important that people know what AI is and what it's not. And I always say it's actually a kind of statistic. So if people complain about uh, racism and biases in, in these systems, they certainly are there, but they're a reflection of uh, biases in our society. And you should avoid that. And that, for that purpose, democratization is very important. Thank you. Wow, excellent. And, and we, the audience have a question. How, what do you motivate to, to study about artificial intelligence and other topic? Uh, is, uh, for when I, what motivates me? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, because I'm interested in how our brain works and how visual system works. So I always wondered how it is possible that we can perceive the world. And um, uh, through these deep learning networks, that gives a kind of hint of how that might work. So if I say that the deep learning network is able to recognize a dog, then I don't mean that literally, because it does not recognize a dog as humans. Because if we recognize a dog, we know how it feels and how it behaves, because we interacted with a dog. And this AI system only was trained on images of dogs, which is very limited. But it gives you some hints of the internals of the deep learning network, how it might work in the human brain. So I'm interested both in the technology, but actually I'm more interested in human brains and how they work. So that motivates me. Ah, super. Someone? Ah, see, they have a question. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, a school teacher in Colombia comments that his students are interested in these topics. Is possible to ask you a recommendation for those, those who want to start uh, work in artificial, artificial intelligence? Yeah, so I, what I always recommend to people, because I get this question a lot, uh, is, uh, and unfortunately it's from one of these big companies, but Google has the so-called Teachable Machine, which is an online site where you can do machine learning interactively with children. It's very easy and very nice to work with. And by playing with it uh, interactively, by asking children to collect data and to train the system, they will see how it works. For instance, you could imagine that they take uh, certain objects like pencils and, and books, and they present it to the system and they train the system on recognizing pencils and books. And they do that inside the classroom. And then the system works very well. And then they go outside and the system don't work, doesn't work anymore because it never saw examples of books and pencils outside. These kind of lessons are very useful to learn about artificial intelligence or more specifically about machine learning which is, is at the heart of the current AI rev revolution. Thank you. Wait. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, have a question? You yes. need to press the button F0. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Eric, I have a question. Is that recently I've seen the, I don't know if you say the technology, but the final result of GTP3. Have you seen? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can can you like yeah. express yourself about this this technology or what you think the future? Yeah, about? yeah. Yeah, so GPT-3 is a, is a development from OpenAI, which they now sold to Microsoft. And GPT-3, at first sight, is very impressive because you can ask GPT-3 questions and it seems as if it's understanding your questions. And uh, at first, the first uh, uh, messages on the internet were, we have a very intelligent machine here because it's trained on all the text on the internet and even more than that. And what it actually is trained on is if you give them a uh, part of the sentence, it fills in the rest. You can even uh, have a first sentence and let uh, GPT-3 complete it into a complete essay. Uh, but the point is that this system is actually kind of a kind of a book that looks up all, all the similar text that it has seen before. It, it is not intelligent. It's a very powerful support tool for if you want to write text or if you want to have a question answering system. But uh, the claim that it's intelligent is totally, um, is totally not true. It's a very impressive thing because it contains all the information of the internet that we could never contain ourselves. But again, it has no common sense. It has no understanding of the world. I think that's important to realize. Does that answer okay. your question? Yeah. Yes, totally, because okay. when, when, we, when I saw it, I, I got so impressed that I said, this technology could replace ourselves by creating, for example, websites automatically. So it's, it's impressive. Yes, yeah. So and th that's that's a support tool. But what I think in general is true for AI is that uh, it's not replacing you; it's enhancing you. So rather than spending your time on the stupid work of setting up a website, you can spend more time on thinking on how you can improve the website, for instance. And this tool is helping you. So I, I guess for the coming 10 years, you will see a lot of these AI tools that uh, put the burden off you to spend more creativity in the design rather than doing the bor uh, bo uh, boring work. Totally. I, I understand what you said, but for example, so that boring part is a work of, of someone, you know? So in, in 10 years, this will be replaced as, as if it was in the industrial age, you know? Machine replaced yeah. man. So this is like the evolution, I think. Yeah, I think it's a, there's a slight difference. So it's not wrong what you're saying, but it's a slight difference, which is subtle. It's not a replacement, it's a reshifting of, of what is required. So many of the tasks that are now being done by humans will be replaced by machines. And the best way to anticipate on that is education and make sure that people are equipped with the knowledge to integrate their work with this computer. It's not that the computer takes over everything. It's taking over specific tasks. But the human, I think it will actually make the human concept more important than it is. Thank you, Eric. Amazing. You're welcome. You and, walk and talk about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. You can press this. Thank F2. you. you Great can press presentation. Number four. I number four many times. <laughs> <laughs> Someone have a question before we come continue to the next speaker? Alguien más tiene alguna pregunta? Se la traducimos. Alguna pregunta, quizás que quieran hacerle a nuestro invitado Eric. I I have before Eric leaving. I I think you have very interesting project with the planets. No? Yeah. You can tell briefly yeah. <laughs> what do you yeah. do with this data? <laughs> and the stars. Yeah, so it's very cool. It's very cool. Yeah, so there's a big project. Uh, it's called the, uh, the, or a satellite that is sent out by NASA. It was called the Kepler satellite, and now it's the test satellite. It's, it's, uh, it's in space and it's looking for all the stars in the sky. And it's pointing its camera at these stars to measure the light. Uh, from the stars. And it's uh, taking a measurement every 12 seconds or 20 seconds and uh, variations in light mean that there's something between moving between the star and the camera. And typically this might be an exoplanet. So a planet 
moving around this star like Earth or Pluto or Venus or whatever. Yeah, Pluto is not a planet. But... And um, so you get a lot of time series and you can use these convolutional neural networks, the deep learning networks to automatically detect these kind of exoplanets. So this project is about the automatic detection of exoplanets from data. This has also been done by Google, and uh, we try to outperform their performance by uh, applying our models to the same data. Wow. Perfect. <laughs> in, the, in the future, the children also, always the children love about this topic a lot, no? And also, uh, maybe in the future, can we play with something, with the data you're thinking in the future, the children have the knowledge how can play with this because there are in latin america one who discovered i think it's from peru ecuador who discovered about um, the the alienation of the planets or uh, something like that yeah i think you could put a virtual reality version of the uh, of the galaxy <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. and uh, visit these planets. That would be great because all this information tells you uh, how many planets are hovering around the star. So you could uh, virtually travel through the galaxy, which would be impossible for us because these distances are huge. But virtually you can just visit them and put all the information about these exoplanets into your virtual reality uh, rendering. That would be great. That would be amazing. Actually, yes. Google Earth, yeah. this is for Mars and Earth, but we need more planets. <laughs> yeah, now there every every star, all, every uh, I think one in five stars has planets like uh, Earth. So there's an enormous amount. So it would be great. Yes, perfect. <laughs> and I think it's very interesting <laughs> idea. And the people who is watching this live and also can see it later or is in here have a new ideas how we can use artificial intelligence and also the information of the planets in virtual reality and all a techno immersive technology. And thank yeah. you so much. We can uh, press F2. <laughs> to, to thank you. Thank you.